right. Well, good morning. Um, you know, we do have a group of us here today who are all kind of familiar with um, the education system in Olmstead County. So I'm excited to just dive a little deeper with Listos. Um, we have a few parts today in our agenda. Um, so that's learning about United Way's mission and investments in early education. Um, we're going to have a fireside chat with Christina, who's also going to give us a virtual tour of Listos and talk about their education approach and how they're promoting an equitable and culturally enriching learning experience for kids and parents. Um, and then we'll conclude with how we can help support sustainability and retention um, and just general awareness um, for the need for high quality early education and just what the what gaps um, Listos are filling in our community. So I will throw it over to Vanjie to give a little bit more insight on the mission of United Way and as it relates to education. Hi, I'm Vanjie Castro. I'm the Impact Program Assistant here at the United Way of Olmstead County. And so we at Olmstead County unite people to the resources that they need in our community to live vibrant and thriving lives. We believe education, health, and financial stability are the building blocks to a quality life. So we encourage people like you to give, advocate, and volunteer. So this is a wonderful way to learn about some of the organizations that we partner with and we help support and fund in various different ways through technical support and administrative support. United Way of Olmsted County's education priorities our early learning currently with developmental milestones, only 30% of Rochester children are fully prepared for kindergarten in the area of language and literacy. Scholarships to childcare and learning centers are some of the things that we have helped fund. And at least those is one of those organizations that we're gonna learn about today. All right, so before we pass it on to Christina, um, I just wanted to say that this event is hosted by our Women United Affinity Group. Um, so this is a group of 130 um, women in our community who are passionate about teaming with United Way and supporting our collective impact model and um, really being able to combine resources, um, whether it's combining efforts as a volunteer group, an advocacy group, a donor group um, to really help extend um, programs and reduce the need um, for, for those services in the future. So being a little bit more preventative and catching needs in our community. So um, if you're interested in Women United, you can reach out to me. Um, but with that, let's go ahead and learn a little bit more about Listos. So Christina, I will pass it on to you. Hi, I'm Christina Valdez. I'm the executive director at Listos Preschool and Child Care. So we're a dual immersion Spanish and English program serving children ages three to five. We're um, a nonprofit under the fiscal sponsor of Peace United Church of Christ. And that's where also where we're located. And so because um, today we are not open on a Saturday and we also have to be careful to make sure, you know, sharing images of children. So we recorded yesterday a miniature tour of our school and made sure that the parents were aware and could sign off. So I'm happy to show you around via video. Um, we'll just take a second. There we go. So we're located up on the second floor at East United Church. These are children coming in from, we have two playgrounds outside. One's a natural playground and one's a traditional playground. This first room is our office where um, Ms. Viri um, works with our children and families. Hello, hola. Welcome to Listos. Bienvenidos a Listos. 
here's one of our classrooms. Um, this is uh, our half day classroom. So on Friday, there wasn't children in this room, but it's really set up in different learning areas. Here's um, coming down the hallway, we have flags, different countries. We provide meals, four meals during the day, breakfast, two snacks. Music and stories and visuals are a big part of learning. Here's some pictures of activities throughout the, the school year. This one was from before. This is our butterfly festival. Mm -hmm. Don't act you. Apiade de nosotros. No queremos morir. Suddenly, the sky opened. Don't act you. The God of the Sun, admired by the goodness of the people, told them that he would make them an eternal being. And he turned them into a balot, which means butterfly, so that they could easily travel to where their relatives were. This is why it is said that the butterflies return year after year to Mexico in gratitude to the gods.
Okay, so that was a little bit, showed a little bit of our school. We have three classrooms and um, then it showed a little bit about our time in the community that we do some of our own community events. And we also partner with many other community events to provide um, cultural programming and children's programming. You want me to jump right into a little bit more about our program? Sure, if you wanna do the PowerPoint, um, I'm wondering if you'd be okay with just having open kind of floating questions or dialogues yeah. as you walk through things. So um, I guess before you get into your PowerPoint, I'm kind of curious to know a little bit more of your um, enrollment numbers and like size of classrooms and just maybe different changes or trends over time with that. Yeah, so this school year we started with 46 children, but we broke them into four groups because we're still really following a lot of the COVID guidance of smaller group sizes. And so we had 20, let me see, 24 that were, no, 28 that were full day, and then the rest are half day, so either morning or afternoon. So we have a morning program from nine to noon and afternoon from one to four. And there's nine children in each of those groups. And so it kind of split them up into the three different classrooms, but one is a split classroom for two groups. Um, and so over the years, we've kind of changed. So typically it's run between 36 because for a while we we're running two classrooms of 18 students. Um, but sometimes because we kind of look at each year to year. So 36 has been our lowest, but about 46 has been our largest groups. We did also have, um, when I was doing our annual report, looking back <laughs> when I did our 2021 annual report, it really looked like 2022 because at that time too, we ran four different groups, but nine of those children, rather than being preschoolers, they were school agers because we had um, hybrid learning children that were here and well, they he were here doing distance learning too. Um, that really had to happen, uh, otherwise we wouldn't have had staff because they had young elementary children. <laughs> so we needed a place for, for those children. But then also we did have um, some of our siblings of the children that were here be in that classroom too with our staff children. So we were licensed for preschool and school age children. Um, so I kind of, uh, I can share a little bit about that too in the, Sounds good, thank you for that information. This kind of shows some of, so a little bit about our history and, and what we work on in the classroom, what we're working on in the community and how we're looking ahead and how United Way and others can get involved. So we did open in 2015, so we're in our seventh school year. It's really been a grassroots community effort. Um, Peace United Church of Christ has been our fiscal sponsor throughout all of this and has been an amazing supporter and, and contributor. So they helped us get started with a no interest startup loan. And then they've really been supportive in our programming. The people that attend the church here have been helpful throughout and really giving us a nice low um, rate for our our rent here so we can have you know keep our tuition low for our families and be able to support our staff by having that partnership also from the beginning that we've been partnered with school readiness which reserves out spaces with scholarships for our students um like i said we serve about 36 to 46 children each year we are year-round though so we do have summer programming as well <clears throat> About one third of our students receive a scholarship or tuition assistance. Um, so that includes childcare assistance, early learning scholarships, and the school readiness scholarships. And then we also do a fundraising to be able to provide our own tuition assistance for families that are on waiting lists for a lot of those um, state programs. Our families are very diverse. So we have, since we're dual immersion, we have a mix of children who come from Spanish speaking backgrounds and children who come from English speaking backgrounds and other language backgrounds too at home. 
And so they're here together to learn together and um, being dual immersion, that means we have English and Spanish instruction throughout the day. And then because um, children really learn through play that they have that opportunity to um, learn language from each other and practice language with each other. Um, we do use creative curriculum, which is a national curriculum, and that comes with a gold observation system that really helps track how the children are developing and learning. Um, creative curriculum, you'll find it at Head Starts and other programs around the country, and it does come already with the books and, and study guides and everything in English and in Spanish. Um, we also use conscious discipline, which is a trauma-informed approach to having self-regulation and social emotional learning and problem solving. So really our staff and, and our students work together on remaining calm and, and recognizing emotions and problem solving together. And then Early Learning Core is the new name for Reading Core. For, um, we have tutors from the community and some of our teachers have been part of the Educator Core. So they use a lot of the early math and early literacy um, programming from the state. And like I said, we have done a lot of work in the community to bring our, our cultural learning that the children have in the classrooms and at home into the community. And so, and we wanna build community within our families too. So throughout the years we've done um, events for adults, which is our Day of the Dead fundraising dinner, which is this, the picture on the left shows we had Peru as a focus one year, we've had Mexico as focus as other years, but it's a chance for adults to come together and try the food and learn about Day of the Dead and about a country and about our programming too. Um, and then with COVID, we haven't been able to have those sit down meals. And so we, um, introduced the Butterfly Festival, which is a family event that uses the monarch butterflies, the connection between Minnesota and Mexico. And so we had Quarry Hill Nature Center and then our own program director, Verdiana, who was telling the Aztec stories of the legends of the butterflies. And then we did have displays of how the butterflies also relate to Day of the Dead because as they migrate from Minnesota to Mexico, that they um, arrive in Mexico traditionally around the time of Day of the Dead. So they're seen kind of as a remembrance of the souls who are returning. Um, and then the picture on the right shows, we've been at the farmer's market. We've done fashion shows and story times and, and things in Spanish there. And over the years, we had several years where we partnered with the library and Gage and Riverside Elementary Schools to do Spanish story times and so we would go to the different sites and have readers be able to read and sing stories and do activities with the children in Spanish. Um, we've also been at World Festival and the IMAAs Walk Around the World, Rochester Fest, um, and the so lots of different community events and then also trying to have our own events for our families. We've had um, carnivals here, but then also there's times where, because they're all on the same journey together and they want to have those relationships between their children, but then themselves too. So to be able to have time where even after they graduate that they come back and do events together. Um, part of our social responsibility is um, we are part of the culturally powered communities through United Way and so and we're also signed on as the undersigned for the commitment to racial justice. We really see that as a way to, you know, hold us responsible and accountable for making sure that we're providing a, a positive environment for, for all children to be able to, to be reflected and, and, and see themselves in a positive way and be able to work together and, and learn how to, you know, navigate this world that we're, we're in and be able to advocate for each other. And then we are also part of Kids Count on Us, which is a statewide coalition of childcare 
um, programs that are really advocating on behalf of children and families at the for the, at the state and federal levels to receive the funding that is really needed to support early educators and support children and families and to make sure that we have high quality curriculums and programs that are accessible for all children. Um, and then looking ahead, we um, are, are working on becoming our own 501c3 and seeing how that will be able to help us grow and change and be able to serve more families in the community in different ways. And so um, it's really, it's gonna be a, a long process where we are hoping to get more community involvement and working together with other people and groups, but really we see a bright future for, for our children and our families to be working together. Um, and I was say, we also do have other partners too with Cradle to Career and IMAA and the Olmsted County Bridge Collaborative are some of the ones that we work with a lot along with School Readiness and um, the Rochester Area Foundation and Southern Minnesota Initiative. And then ways to get involved would really, we have events, but we also have, we post those on the United Ways Volunteer Board. And then we also have, if people are interested in sharing skills or interest with families in our classrooms that we're slowly opening that up to be able to have visitors come into our programs again. And then um, if anyone's interested in being on our board and really doing that, that strategic planning vision growth, that would be um, a great way to help grow in our community. And that's kind of, all I have about that. Should I stop to share? Yep. There. <laughs> okay. So that was kind of, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's just so nice to get a little deeper look into what you do and your involvement and all the different partnerships that it takes. Um, I know you mentioned getting involved um, with the board and volunteer opportunities. Um, I'm wondering if you can share a little bit more about what specific skills you are looking for um, with helping families or in the classroom. You know, I think we have a lot of times those people that definitely want to have a one-off volunteer opportunity or they do want that deeper dive and doing more board stuff, but um, if there's like a quarterly or a recurring kind of skill that you can use, you know, what are those that you're most in need of? Um, so for like one-time skills, we are going to be having some events coming up. Um, first, we're going to be starting. So we have a grant to, to work with our families and we can open it to the community as well about teaching some of those conscious discipline skills for adults that they can be using at home. And so we're gonna be running the classroom, the classes for adults here. Um, and it's gonna be bilingual in Spanish and English. And so then we wanna have volunteers to be able to, you know, play with the kids and do um, some of the, the support for, so the families can be in their learning time. So, and the children can be, can be playing so we'll have our own staff there too but if we have um, many children it would be nice to have more hands just to be you know just like just an hour there to be able to take time to spend with the children hopefully that it'll be a nice day that they can be outside on the playground and doing bubbles and things outside while the, the families are doing their learning we also have some classes coming up where it's going to be looking at um, how families can talk to their children about race and so we'll be doing that too, where the children will be doing activities separate from the families while the adults are learning. And so we'll have those coming up this spring and then ideally we'll, we can post those and we have the times and days. Um, and ideally if there's anybody who has a skill or a talent, probably next school year would be hopefully a nice safe time to come in. So we've had people come in and play piano where the piano top is open and the children can see how the piano works inside. We've had doctors come in, we've had, um, and be able to show, that was one of our parents who showed kind of how the blood goes through the veins and into the heart. So if there's um, 
some hands-on things that people have, and especially if you're bilingual and can share the information in Spanish too, that's always fun to have visitors that speak Spanish coming in. Um, so we want children to be able to see themselves in the community and what people are working on in the community too. And then, yeah, just those skills for, um, we have an amazing 10 member board right now who is really active and engaged. Um, and, but if we're open to having up to 12 to 14 members of our board since we have a flexible number. So if there's anybody who has kind of like the, the growth skills to be able to help us move into the, to the next phases of our development plan, that would be, um, you don't even necessarily have to be on the board, but if there was um, time that you wanted to, to share some of your expertise or ideas too, we're gonna be working on, on that kind of programming too. Great, that's helpful. It's it's nice to hear kind of the, some of the things that you have planned. And um, I know that when we profiled Listos for the Culturally Powered Communities Program, um, you talked about, you know, the focus is on education, um, but that the kids are going to be leaving the school, you know, so how do you set the kids and the families up for success, you know, after this Listos experience and help in other realms and daily life. And I think you definitely hit on some of that just with the conscious discipline and, you know, learning how to talk about race and more of that adult education that you're offering. Um, do you have any other, you know, stories or um, focuses that you prioritize to support um, kids and families within housing or healthcare or policy or things like that? Yeah, so in the past, we've been um, able to have organizations come in to meet with our, our families. And so, um, so if somebody has been having issues, so we build really strong relationships, trusting relationships with our families. So we kind of know what issues that they're facing and we, and sometimes we pull them to what would be the most beneficial. But so we've brought in outside agencies to do um, classes about various topics, but including, so if you're having an issue with your landlord, because right at the beginning of COVID, there was people that were, you know, still not having the, the funding that they needed. So we introduced, um, well, we had already had classes, but we had already built up relationships with the legal assistance of Olmsted County so we could connect families that were having specific um, issues to specific organizations in the in the area that can be helpful. And so having those connections to other outside organizations is, is helpful in knowing what our families need, but then advocating to in general so to make sure that our families and our community knows that like, especially just looking right now, our state has a surplus. And so we need to get that into the priority areas that are really going to support children. So children are not going to do their best learning if they don't have, you know, affordable housing that they're in and reliable transportation and accessible, affordable health care. And so making sure that, um, yes, that we need support for early learning, but early learning and all that long-term education is, is really, there's a lot of the other foundation that has to be in place to make that successful as well. So really to make sure that people are reaching out to our legislators to make sure that our, the priorities is, you know, giving children a voice, they don't have a chance to vote or to do anything. So making sure that, that we're supporting the families and making sure the community knows that um, the children need the support now and that our state fortunately has a surplus and so hopefully that they can make it so it's beneficial. Sanji, Elaine, do you have any questions that you wanna talk about? Mm -hmm. Go for it, Elaine. Yeah, I had a couple of questions. <clears throat> it was really a good presentation, Christina. Thank you. I enjoyed the video a lot too. So one of my questions is about teacher training. Um, I know I've done some work with a couple other preschools using gold, and I think it's a fantastic platform, but it does take quite a bit of teacher training, and that's quite an investment. Do you do that? Do you support that teacher training? How does that, how does that work? 
our program is extremely fortunate that we are partnered with school readiness. So being a program under school readiness, that they really are the ones that we have uh, basically a coach who it works with our staff year round to make sure that they're using the tool properly, that they have the resources that they need, that usually it's typically in August that we go over if we have any new staff that haven't been trained or that staff that need a refresher or like go to deeper into the tool, we can go over to Head Start where they have a lot of the, the training and resources. So if without that partnership, I don't know how we would do it on our own because it is a very intense tool and very, it takes years to really to understand it and to implement it. So it, it would be very challenging to be able to do that as a standalone program without having that partnership and those resources. Okay, that's great. And then I was curious too, so when, when the students leave you to go to public school or wherever they go, do you do any kind of long, longitudinal, I guess, tracking of any of those students just to see how they do as they progress through elementary school, let's say? So we keep in contact usually. So we have like family play groups where they could come and back and see each other. And so it's really just anecdotal that the parents will be like, oh, they're doing great or oh, they're really struggling or whatever. And each child is on their own track too. Mm -hmm. um, so it's typically that it's just anecdotal though, that we, that we stay in contact. We don't have a way to be able to continue to measure them once they're once they're gone in order to know like how they are well besides you know just keeping in touch and seeing you know it's fun to see them grow and I'm like whoa you're in third grade already and you know to see you know that they remember you know they get excited to come back and remember or just run into you somewhere else who knows maybe through cradle to career because I think what you're doing is um is really great and you know, it seems like we should be able to show that that really good, strong basis in early childhood education pays off and, and really makes a difference. So thank you. Yeah, and I think it is important to have that strong basis for the children, but also to make sure that the families are involved because we really have to partner with the families because that's where the children, that's, that's their background, that's their number one teacher, that's going to be part of you know, who they are for their whole lives. And so really to make sure that we're reflecting the family needs and then the family understands, you know, what the child is doing at school too. So fortunately for our program, for our families that speak Spanish, they can just talk directly to their child's teacher. There, you don't have to wait for an interpreter or anything. And you can just pick up and drop off, have a conversation and let everybody know, you know, so we're all on the same page and then so that's a nice thing too. So it'd be nice to be able to have that, you know, in other settings as well. But yeah, to have that partnership and that trust and understanding is really beneficial too. Thank you for your presentation, Christina. That was um, amazing. And uh, my question, you had mentioned earlier and Lakin also that you're a, a culturally powered community partner with the United Way. What has your experience been um, so far? So um, this, that's a new uh, initiative by United Way. So I feel like we're, we're learning from each other as we're, as we're going through this. And so I don't know if other people outside of here know, but I'm part of the mainstream program. So the, the white cohort of, of programs where we're led by a white person um, who, is taking time to really reflect and create plans and be held accountable to make sure that we have diversity, equity, and inclusion, not just plans on paper, but that we're actually um, committed to making change and to continued learning and self-reflection. And um, like Listos too, I think it's very important for us to be a part of this. So we're not, you know, being a part of cultural appropriation where we're taking the Spanish language and giving it to white children who are then praised for it, whereas Spanish speaking children who come from that as a background might be getting 
like scolded or yelled at for speaking Spanish, whereas other children are getting praised. So we really wanna make sure that we're working with families and children and not taking from one group and giving to another, or, you know. Um, so it's it's been a really, you know, kind of a, a long-term work in progress, but also being held accountable and making sure that we're doing our best and we're continuing to learn and that we're, we're sharing that too. And then um, we're working kind of side by side that by the culturally led communities programs. And so we get to learn from them and see what they're working on and, and what their interests are and how their growth plans are working. So they're really working at growing. So it's been, it's been a, a journey and a learning experience and I'm excited to be a part of it. And I, I hope to continue to learn and grow and make change from this. You kind of hit on it um, as we were talking about curriculum and volunteering and teachers. Um, I know that United Way has kind of looked at just the need for retaining um, early childhood educators. And um, I know you even have some advocacy around that. Um, so I guess just from your standpoint, you know, what can community members or Women United members do to um, help with retention issues or shortage issues related to um, early education? I do want to have everybody get the word out that being an early educator is an amazing career that I feel like it's not often looked at as a career. Um, it's more of a stepping stone into other sorts of education or just like a short-term thing that you're gonna do while you're working on something else. But really it's, it's an amazing career where you're actually making like lifelong difference in, in these children because those early years are, are very foundational. That's so much brain development is happening and so many seeds are being planted that will impact them for the rest of their lives. So in order to like really hold this up as a profession where people are getting like professional pay and getting benefits and having it be like a long-term sustainable career to that make sure that we have the funding in place from the state and the federal government to make sure that it is accessible, that this is a, a career and that that will better serve our children and families too. So when they have long-term teachers in place that have the experience and education that they need to really make a difference and to, you know, so I think we need a whole systemic change in this field, but I really see that, I mean, there's so many places that are just like Listos that have amazing staff and are, are doing amazing things. And so just to be able to make that systemic change where that they their funding is in place. So it's not the burden put on the families and then families are kind of pushed out and not able to access it. And that the staff don't feel like it can do it as a long-term career, even though if it's something that they love, your passion doesn't pay your bills. So just to make sure that um, that 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 early um, care and education is is truly funded as an essential service that it is, we won't have families going to work if they don't have the childcare that they need. And in the future, we won't have the workers that we need if they don't have that foundational skills. So. Right. Yeah. I mean, I appreciated just the context of, you know, we had more people at least dose during the pandemic because, you know, distance learning and siblings or who else needed to come and, and be together. And, you know, I think that was a reality for so many people. And um, so, yeah, just, it, like was said, it was essential. In the beginning, it was a shock, though, yeah. like when yeah, when March 2000 came and all of a sudden we went from 36 to four children because everybody either lost their jobs or was working from home, then it was like, whoa. But then really, we're fortunate in Rochester, um, Vanji had kind of looked at some questions before, but we had that together fund. And at that point, we were had only been to, around for five years. We we're just paying off our loans. We didn't have any like savings and all of a sudden we had no income. And so we're like, whoa, but then the, our Rochester community really stepped up to make sure that there are services in place. And we did get 
we got a loan um, from Rochester Area Foundation that really helped us fill that gap. And then fortunately we got the payroll protection and then we were able to stay open. And then finally that following fall that the state kind of stepped in and was working on helping make sure that that childcare was gonna be there. <laughs> so um, yeah, it was, it got really scary there <laughs> for a while, but yeah. I'm sure. Are there any other questions, Elaine or Vanjie, that you have? No, no I think I... you covered everything. <laughs> Go ahead, Elaine. No, it was an excellent session. Thank you. Yeah, it was. So, Christina, any last kind of call to action for people or something that you want to leave um, the session with people knowing? I just think that everybody should know that birth to five are critical foundational years. And if you, even if you don't have children, that this is going to be a critical part of our whole community and our whole society. So really to make sure that it's funded and that we are working together and partnering and that the children are our main focus, our main priority. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was so nice just to get the deep dive, um, learn a little bit more. I'm excited about sharing some of these upcoming op opportunities with the rest of Women United um, about some of the trainings and volunteer opportunities and events that are coming up. So please do stay in touch so that we can um, keep people informed of what Listos is doing. And we're excited to share out and continue partnering with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.